Good evening, everybody, and welcome to Punch, Kick, Choke, Chat. My name is Sean Benson. I'm one of your hosts. We're 8.30 Toronto time for me. I've been home for a little bit, and uh, it's been nice. It's been really nice to be training here with, with my club and my teachers, and, and I'm real happy about it. And tonight, we're here with Sifu Mark Medeiros, and uh, I'm really excited to ask you this question. We've had some people who do Jeet Kune Do on this show, but I can't believe I've never asked this. Is it the original MMA? Uh, the great I, original MMA. So it, it depends on kind of what factions you ask. Me personally, there was Pancras was around long before uh, Jeet Kune Do was. Um, I just think, don't think it was kind of uh, common knowledge. So Pancras is, you know, they had ground, stand up, clinch. Fighting is fighting. It's been around since forever. I think what makes Jeet Kune Do uh, unique is it's uh it has specific principles and qualities that it actually looks right and the whole thing is it's about interception uh so the art in its higher form right you can look at somebody you can hit somebody can hit somebody during their strike you can hit somebody before their strike but in jeet Kune Do, you want to try to hit them on preparation right so keeping distance and watching them watching their body movement their body language and on their anticipation that's when you want to intercept them. For example, if somebody, you know, in Muay Thai, uh, especially the Dutch style, you'll see somebody who want to throw a rear leg kick. They'll step off on their lead leg on a 45 to give them the angle to throw that kick. So a Jeet Kune Do martial artist, what he will look to do. In Muay Thai, you'll see the concept of intercepting with the cut kick. But for in Jeet Kune Do, for example, because it's meant to be a street art, is if I were to see that leg open up for them to step, immediately I would low leg side kick that lead posting leg because I'm going to kill the kick right from its conception, right? Because that leg needs to pivot and turn in order for the hips to generate the power to swing that kick. So once that knee is turned and facing me, once I kick that, I'll blow it out and that kick just gets killed right there. So Jeet Kune Do has specific uh, principles and theories it follows. So no, I don't believe it's original MMA. I think I would say Pancrase would be that. Right on. And uh, you used a word we like around here. So I want you to break it open a little. You said it's a street art. And yeah. um, I'd like to know what what your, you know, conception, broad idea of that is. Okay, so the thing is this, right? Like a lot of people who do uh, street combatives, right? It's very bad thing for me to say, you know, if you do this, I'm just going to poke you in the eye or I'm just going to kick you in the groin. Um, I've been in real fights, you know, and sometimes people don't stop after that. You know, sometimes you poke somebody in the eye, but they get a hold of you and they'll hold on to you and they'll still headbutt you because they use their tactile sense now, right? You guys are judo players, jiu-jitsu players. Once that tactile is on there, you can kind of brace that energy. It might not necessarily stop. Uh, you can get people kicked in the groin that have a high tolerance of pain or they're, they're being influenced by drugs. They're not going to feel the same way. So it's like you can't just rely on saying I would do these things and call it a street art. You have to have good fundamentals and you have to be able to box. You have to be able to kickbox. You have to be able to have some type of grappling to be effective in the street. You have to have that coordination and timing. Now, that being said, when you're looking at a street combatives art, there's no rounds. I'm not worried about points and there's no referee, right? There's no, my terrain is going to be different, uh, whether it's wet, whether it's dry, sand, grass, hill, parking lot, cars. So and the other thing, too, is like when we say self-defense, we're not talking, people get confused, too, because you can look at it two aspects, right? You have street fighting and then you have self-defense. So I look at it like this. It's not where it's two guys in a bar, you know, somebody steps on my shoes and now we're going to go outside and mano a mano, fisticuffs. That's an agreement. That's a street fight. Self-defense usually is like I'm not looking to have an altercation, but yet now I'm being put in a position where I have to defend my life. And you know, that is a different, completely animal at the same time. So even in that respect, you have to kind of splice it into those two. Am I agreeing to fight with somebody on the street or am I defending myself, my person or my property? Because I don't, I don't want to, but I have to. And so that changes the dynamic of things. And when I think about self-defense, I, I always break it down the way I teach it. I always break it down to three things because if somebody attacks me, First of all, I don't know when that attack is going to happen. I don't know who's going to do it. I don't know where it's going to happen. I don't know how I'm going to feel like that day. I don't know if my family is going to be with me. You don't know. It's the unknown, right? So you can't prepare for the unknown. So when somebody grabs you, it's not like I'm not going to, my memory is going to go through its files and just pick out a technique. That's not how it works. However, under high pressure, high stress, I can only make a few decisions. And that's number one. Do I need to get out of here? Do I need to stay here? And do I need to defend a family member? So now if I have three simple objectives, 
my fighting or my defense will, will align with that. Meaning if I'm in a bar and something happens, do I need to get fuck out? Of, do I need to get out of here? And if I need to get out of here, my tactic is going to be much different. I don't want to stay and grapple. I'm going to hit, I'm going to stay, I'm going to put something in my way and I'm going to wor work towards my exit. Whereas if maybe I'm being abducted or I need to be taken into the alleyway, now I'm going to fight differently. I'm going to grab onto things. I'm going to grab onto this person. I'm going to fight totally different. And then if I'm with a loved one, now I need to have them behind me. I need to have them contact with me. Maybe I give them my keys so they can go to the car and I'm going to fight so that I'm blocking my attacker through there. If I can't, if I get caught up with that attacker, I don't know if there's a secondary attacker who's going to come to my loved one. So these are the things that I focus on more when it comes to street self-defense. And when I attack, I'm looking to specifically uh, target three things, their mobility, their consciousness, like, or their, their, their sight. I want to get rid of their eyesight. I want to get rid of their mobility and I want to knock them out if possible. Um, I really love that. I was, I was teaching my class last night, some bunkai, some applications from the kata. And one of them was like, it feels like a lot of these are like when something happens to you. And I was like, well, yeah, because you're not going to go start a fight. No. You're responding to something you can't avoid. And I like the way you just talked about that. And I like the way you just talked about self-defense, but not as a series of you do this, then this, then this. Self-defense is a concept of I'm literally defending myself. Let's go around the horn on this one. Sensei Suino, um, what, what makes a street art and what makes an effective self-defense? Man, that's a great question. I think what uh, Sifu said is really true that uh, mindset is critical and um, having feed forward is critical too. I talk about this a lot. You know, if you've never experienced a traumatic event, the first time you do, your whole system is going to break down. But if you've experienced one, the next time you may have a little bit better idea how to behave in that in that moment with the adrenaline shock and everything else. And the closer you can reproduce that in regular training, you know, you hear me say pressure testing all the time. The closer you can reproduce that in regular training, the better off you're going to be. Um, but one of the things that Sifu said that I really like is kind of the, it's the first time we really heard somebody distinguish between what I call a bar fight, right? A gentleman's agreement to go trade hands and a street fight where someone just attacks you. It's definitely a different mindset. And generally speaking, you don't think of a bar fight as something that's likely to end in death. Whereas when somebody, uh, you know, attacks you all of a sudden on a city street or attacks you when you're with your family, that seems like a much more reasonable outcome. So uh, uh, I thought that was cool to, to think about it that way. Thanks, Sensei Suino. Sensei Dauphin, what do you think makes a street art an effective self-defense? A street art, uh, an effective self-defense. I'm not sure I understand that question, but I'm just going to go with the line of the conversation that we've been having. I think you got to come outside of the rule set of your whatever it is. Like there's a rule set in BJJ. There's a rule set in karate. When you come in this place, I, and I think sometimes that creates like some fantasy in people's minds about how things will actually play out. Um, so uh, I think you need to have a teacher who explains things a little differently to you, not like, you know, this low block is going to be the be all end all. It's going to work for everything. You're always going to be able to get this triangle on somebody. I think those are fantasies. Right. I like what uh, Sifu said about terrain, no referees. Referees imply a rule set mm -hmm. and somebody to help you with that rule set and make sure you follow the rule set. Terrain is something I talk about all the time. You know, is your high roundhouse kick to the head the most effective self defense technique in January <laughs> on an icy sidewalk when somebody's wearing like a parka and mittens and seven layers of clothes? It's not. Right. So um, I think all the arts are good and they can all they're all going to help you if you your mindset is right and you have the right variety of techniques. Um, so that's my my take on that. Thanks, Sensei. And um, there's something I just want to point out that you've said to me a lot. But, you know, in the street, people aren't wanting to spar with you. They want something from you or they want to hurt you. There's just the only two reasons they'll come at you. And I, I always think about that. Like once a week, that thought goes through my mind. Hanchi Legacy, what about you? Where do you go with the idea of a street art or effective self-defense or whatever you want to say about it? I'm basically, uh, Mark said mostly everything. Uh, the only thing is, um, if you do hard training, it's like everyone else moves in slow motion. That's just... That's just the way it is. It's a bit like that show. Uh, I can't think of uh, what the name of it is right now, but 
the other person, they just move slow, right? And the, the thing is, as a martial artist, you still have to have a bit of compassion because if just a punk who doesn't know what's going on and he's trying to show off to his girlfriend or something, you can't really do damage. It's Or if it's a high school fight or something like that. But on the other hand, when you're facing more than one opponent and they're after you for some reason, uh, maybe money or whatever, um, you know, you can't just slap that guy away and then turn your back on him. He'll pick up a baseball bag and brain you. So there are different types of self-defenses and you have to immediately realize what kind of self-defense you're in. If you're fighting for your life, is it just somebody who wants a dime or something, you know? But other than that, um, yeah, uh, what uh, Mark said was absolutely on the money. Um, I do want to go back to you. Thanks, Hanchi. Uh, Sifu, hey, with... Hey, Benz, I want to mention something, a thought that I have is that um, I've said this to the person that you need to take most serious is the one who wants to engage with you. They're not going to come and pick a fight with you if they think you're going to kick their ass. They're going to come and pick a fight with you because they think they can get that stuff from you or they think they can beat you up or they think, or they're not in their right mind, they're on drugs or alcohol, but you need to take anybody who stands in front of you and wants to try and knock your block off fairly seriously. And as a classical martial artist, you could ask Matt Samora about his wife and not taking her serious and what happened to him when he didn't. I just... Okay. Um, if I could just add on to that for a second, I, I agree with uh, Sensei said, but here's the problem about self-defense is that people who train self-defense are looking to empower themselves and give themselves tools because they are good people. They don't want to be a victim. Here's the problem about learning self-defense from good people is they're good people. <laughs> so, before I learned martial arts, I, I hung around with shitheads. I was a shithead. Okay. And the thing that people don't teach you is real cunning people, they come to you with smiles and they will drag you away from your crowd and they will entice you to be in a position where you're alone. And when you're not expecting it, they will sucker you. That is not something that you're going to learn in a classroom. That's something you're going to learn from street smarts. So when I started learning martial arts, I already had a, I already had a history and I understood what those people were like. And I thought I knew how to fight until I learned how to fight. So when I walked into a dojo, I learned very quickly, I didn't know very quickly that they were very unaware of how the street worked. So there has to be an amalgamation of two, because like I said, your friends are like your teeth when they don't hurt. You know, and I think people need to understand that because when you, when you pressure test things, you know, you're always pressure testing against the target, the, the enemy. Sometimes you don't know who your enemy is. You know, sometimes you have to be aware and why is this person talking to me? Why are they coaxing me? Do I even know this person? Why would I, do I want to be alone with this person? You know, like, and I, and I want to talk about that with, for my daughters when they're older, you know, you got to be careful how nice people are, how willing they are to do things for you, because it could be a bait. It could be a trap. So you have to be aware of that you have to have a good, you know, rules for yourself. And like, here's the area in which I stay in, because this is my safe zone. And when I start to work outside this wheelhouse, now I have a potential to be suckered. I have a potential to be scammed. I have a potential to be drawn away. That's something we need to be cautious of too when training self defense. And self defense doesn't just mean against an attacker. It can mean about you know not don't look in your phone when you're crossing the street. And you don't get hit by a car. So let's just take a sec before we go to our intros and break that open a little because it's such a great concept and it's something we haven't talked about a ton on the show. But how do you give someone street smarts? Like we we have one of the amazing members of our club and a brother of ours out in Vancouver, Sensei Nick McLaren, and he's very vigilant one of the most vigilant people I know where he sits in a Starbucks and which side of the street he walks on. And that's something that his job sort of engendered in him. And when someone doesn't have that overt need out of the gate and they're not necessarily having someone come up to them to try and take what they have on a regular basis, how do you teach that? Like what, what and, and sorry, not just how do you teach it, but what are a few key things our listeners should know? Well, like for me, for example, I have a lot of, I have some clients who are uh, law enforcement, ex-law enforcement, you know, and um, I just talk to them. I ask them questions, you know. I also study case studies. I also watch, you know, documentaries on serial killers. What are the common denominators? What do they look for? They always look to isolate. So number one, don't get isolated. Mm -hmm. um, if somebody wants to give, if they're, anytime somebody 
wants to do something for you, like if I want to do something for you, Sensei Benson, I'd be like, hey, man, uh, if you need this, I got this spare thing in my house. If you want to pick it up, it's yours. Yeah, okay, thanks. And that's it. I've made it known. If you want to grab it, grab it. But if I'm overly persistently pushing you mm. to come get this, that's a red flag, you know? Uh, so it's hard to, like I said, it's hard to plan for the unknown because you don't want to go through life being paranoid. But like research, research. I mean, a, a great way to learn and unfortunately, it's a scary way to learn. Go travel. Go travel somewhere where there's poverty and watch how many scams are, pickpockets, hotel thieves, uh, all kinds of things, man. Anytime there's an opportunity for somebody to get something, they'll be creative. And so you need to understand what the game is. You know, understand where are, we, where are you traveling to? Where am I going? What's the common crime here? What's the gang? What's What do the police have to look out for? What's the tourists have to worry about here? Just do your research, right? That's that's part of your part of your self defense is always your awareness. Being having knowledge gives you options, right? So if I'm going to travel somewhere, I want to understand where it is I'm going to go and where I'm going to put myself. And then if you can kind of, you know, like I knew I knew going to um, uh, where did I go with my wife? It was in Cuba. I can't remember where it was, but like I was reading up on some spots and where the location was. And my wife wanted to go off resort. I'm like, no, 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 we're good. We paid money. We enjoy it here. And the week that we were there, some people went off uh, the resort and they went and there was a stabbing, you know? So I'm just like, just be smart, be safe, do your research. I love that. We are going to do a quick around the horn on this. And Sensei Dauphin will find his internet back. Um, I'm here. I just need oh. somebody to start my video. Uh, I thought I was the co-host and I could do it myself, but apparently I can't. I got okay, you. sweet. Um, so he's back. To, uh, Sensei Sweeno, what's one bit of... Uh, you know, street savvy, you'd want to offer one of our listeners. Uh, uh, same thing. Pay attention. It's really informative when you go to a place, even in an affluent city like the one I live in, you go to a place where a lot of people go out the restaurant district, get a table out on the street, sit there, enjoy your uh, appetizers and your glass of red wine and look around and watch how people behave. The people that are just there to have dinner, they're not paying attention. They're talking to each other. They're looking for a table, but there's always opportunists. You can see them walking around and they're looking differently than everybody else. They're looking at different things. Their eyes linger too long. They might ap approach some people almost like uh, like uh, like the wolves approach the outside of a herd, right? Looking for the weakness, looking for people that are receptive to their to the things they say. And you spend an hour or two doing that. You never act the same way again in a crowd because it just makes you realize that in 100 people there's three or four or seven people that are going to be opportunists on a, on a minor level or a major level and they're always out there 100 percent. i love that sensei suino um sensei dolphin what's one bit of street savvy you'd offer to a, a listener who who maybe hasn't come up in a tough or, or need to find that yet yeah i just want to say what sifu mark was talking about i'm happy to come when you're talking about this stuff, I'm happy to come from a biker background. And I know Sense of Legacy feels the same way because you're, you're around those type of knuckleheads and you see how they interact. And it's easier to see it when you're on the inside. When you're on the outside, it's harder to see it um, and harder to learn from it. But I guess one thing, um, for instance, with my kids, I actually did this with Sense of Suino's daughter one time. We went into a restaurant and I said to her, in this room, who's the most dangerous person in the room? And I always did that with my kids. When we walk into a restaurant, public place, who's the most dangerous person in this room? Now, as a result, when my kids walk into a room, they just kind of look around. And the most dangerous person isn't like, you know, the person with the biggest muscles. It's what Sensei Suino talked about. It's that person whose eyes linger a little too long. They don't really fit in with the crowd. They... Um, Anyway, but I guess to answer your question specifically, Sean, I think everybody should ask themselves, why would somebody attack me? Like you should ask yourself that question because if you're a 13 year old girl, why somebody would attack you is probably diff different. You know, do you wear a Rolex everywhere that you go? Uh, like, why would somebody attack me? Like I'm, I'm in fairly good shape. I have tattoos. I ride a motorcycle. I ask myself that question. I come up with answers often and I'm not saying they're hundred percent, but there's somewhere in the ballpark why somebody would attack me. Right. So I think people should ask themselves, why would somebody attack me? And then 
train a little bit for that purpose. Like have that in your mind sometimes in your training. Don't be an easy meal. Um, thanks for that, Sensei. And by the way, I just wrote down the number 1998 because when I was working at Eastside Mario's, you came down for dinner and a beer one night and we did that exact thing at the bar. We looked around and clocked who here looks like they maybe want to start trouble. And there was a guy. Um, you, we've been doing this since the 90s. Um, Hachi Legacy, what's one bit of advice you'd want to give somebody who maybe doesn't know that world as well as some of us might? Well, I like to just so that if people like I see martial arts are watching now, but if you're somebody who's going to join martial arts, you know, this is. Well, I'll just say it this way. How many times in your life, out of how many days, say you live a thousand days, all right? How many times are you going to fight in that? How many times are you going to walk? Are you going to be saying to yourself, oh, am I going to trip? Am I going to trip? Am I going to trip? Or am I going to be attacked? Am I going to be attacked? It's not like that at all. The trained martial artist, just in my opinion, just walk down the street, just like everything else. If something happens, like the matrix things, because you train, will fall into place. Can you get punched in the head? If anybody, Muhammad Ali can get punched in the head if he's signing autographs in a crowd, the guy comes up behind the head. So it's what you can do after that. Yes, you're, you're smart about where you go, but life isn't all about walking along and being paranoid all the time. I don't think it's necessarily about being paranoid. I mean, we do fire drills so we are prepared. We don't think we're going to get burnt every day, but there's definitely yeah. going to be an That's the same as training. Yeah. And, but the thing is this too, is like, it, it really depends for some people where they live. They have to, they have to pay attention every day. You know, some people live in really bad areas. That's high crime. And it's, you know, it's not, I agree with you. We can't live your life being paranoid and always wondering and always looking over your shoulder. No, but we have to train ourselves to like immediately recognize what we know to be as red flags as martial arts who train. There's a balance. Yeah. Basically, that's what I'm saying. Yeah. But you don't have to worry about it. It's in your training. It's like walking. You don't have to look. You know, you automatically look where the water is and go around it or the holes or the fences. That's in your training. Right. So there's. I just think that we're we may be scaring uh, younger persons into thinking that you know when you're a martial artist, that's all you do. So I'm agreeing about what you have to do, but it's in your training. You're a trained martial artist. You're trained walking. You're trained, you know. So it's more natural. Hanchi, we've never talked about this, but along those lines, it was like week three of me taking my demo in karate. Like I just signed up, and someone goes. Uh, what do you do if you're at a bar and someone hits you over the back of the head with a beer bottle and you went, I fall down. And I remember going, I love this because there's no fake answer. Like I tense the back of my chi and, um, and you go, but why was I in the, uh, the bar? Why was I in that bar? Why was my back to where the action was? Uh, what did I do to a guy that he'd want to hit me on the back? Like, you know, and now I started to think differently. Like, oh yeah. Like I used to go to the bars nightly for almost a decade and I would choose my footwear. I'd make sure I wasn't wearing like shoes that could slip too, too much. Cause if I'm out every night, something's going to happen somewhere someday. Uh, anyways, the point is I just really like that idea of just back up, like further up the chain. Where did you make the choice? Cause by the time your back's turned on the guy swing and it's a little late. Um, ladies and gentlemen, we are out of the gate. I love this. We've talked about things we've never talked about on the show. And we're in our like 120th episode plus and I love that. This is why we have you recommending guests. This is why we bring on new guests. It's such a delight, Sifu Mark Medeiros, to be chatting with you already. Uh, we're going to give you the full introduction in a sec. My name's Sean Benson. I'm one of your hosts. And um, I just want to stay out of the gate that if you're watching on the Zoom, we are so happy that you're here as part of this live history. And there's a chat button at the bottom that we want your questions um, for Sifu. And, and that'll help us guide our conversation. And if you're watching uh, on the YouTube or you're listening on podcast, hit that subscribe and like button. We're so happy you're here. Uh, I'm going to break up my intro a little. I've been introducing all the senseis together, but I just want to say, you know, I had the smallest question today about 
wire style punches a certain way and punches another way a little bit less. And I called Hanchi Legacy and like 28 minutes later, he just called me back and just gave me the answer. And I just want to say how pleased I am that, and, and Hanchi doesn't love this type of accolade, but there's literally a 10th Dan who will return my phone call. And I just want to say how proud I am to have an instructor who's trained that hard all his life, but who's also that dedicated to what his students may need. Um, and then I just want to say about Sensei Dolphin and Sensei Suino, um, I didn't join them this time, but these two gentlemen just trained 12 hours with what are four to three minute breaks um, overnight. And I will let them talk about that or not. But, um, you know, there's a reason I follow these people because I had some other things to do, but the dedication, this isn't something they do once. This is something they do. And I just want to make sure my teachers are always those people. So that's my introduction for our co-hosts tonight. Sensei Dofa. See for Maderas. Uh, he holds training and martial arts. Uh, he's been training for 18 years. He holds ranks and teaching certificates in Mo Pai Kempo, Jet Kun Do, Japanese and Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, Wing Chun, and Filipino martial arts and Muay Thai. Um, as well, he's been teaching martial arts and self-defense and law enforcement for 10 years now. Um, and he is currently the head instructor of JKD, Jaquan, Jet Kwon Do at Combat Science. Uh, he runs a podcast like us, and I encourage you to check it out. Uh, the Parley, Real People, Real Talk. Um, I always give a few thoughts of myself. And while I don't know Sifu Maderos really well, we've never met before. I like this conversation already right away. And I can tell he's a person I would like to spend time with and train with because um, I like the way he thinks about martial arts and the way he articulates uh, martial arts. Um, but the one thing I also want to say is he's friends with people that we're friends with. And I know there's, you know, in martial arts, there's not six degrees of separation. There's only one or two degrees of separation. And uh, he's really good friends with Scott Taylor, who's really good all of us here we really like him and when somebody comes with a uh, common friendship then they're instantly friends of ours so uh sifu maderos you're a friend of ours and thank you so much for coming on here we want to learn from you and we already are so thank you for coming on tonight thank you i appreciate it thanks so much sensei dofa um so sifu we always like to start uh the post intro section with a pretty similar question that um, I never get tired of asking, which is what was it like for you growing up and what brought you into your first martial arts club? Okay, so growing up was interesting. Um, my parents uh, hail from uh, San Miguel, which is uh, one of the islands in the Azores off the coast of Portugal. Uh, I'm the youngest of 10 kids, uh, five boys, five girls. I'm the only one born in Canada. Uh, a lot of my brothers and sisters had moved out and were out of the house uh, by the time I was coming up. Uh, I only remember my brother, Manny, and like two of my sisters uh, living at home. Um, my father was a very stoic, uh, hard man. He was a good man, but he was a hard man. There was no, there was no messing around. He was very old school. He's, right now, he's 91 years old. Um, but he was very, he was very firm. Uh, like you didn't mess around with him. Um, so when he expected something, it, you know, it had to be that way. Uh, my brothers are rough. Uh, we used to play fight a lot, wrestle with them a lot. I, well, I get beat up a lot uh, in the exchanges, but it, it was a good time. It was good memories. Um, but like I said, it was very much, I was like uh, a young age. I was kind of like the only boy in the home. I didn't have an older brother, even though I had lots. I didn't have an older brother there to kind of show me the ropes, mm. uh, stuff like that. So I had to figure things out for myself. Uh, there was a huge um, disconnect from what uh, I was living as a young, as a young boy, I was born in the 80. So when I was going to school, it was like uh, in, the, in the nineties. Right. So, um, those times where I was becoming like a teenager, my parents didn't really have an understanding of what uh, I was living because of their, the gap from where they came from and, and, and their lack of understanding of technology and stuff like this. So it was, it was, you know, uh, they were also older, uh, a lot older than most of my friends' parents. So there was some teasing and some bullying there. Um, but, you know, it was a good home. It was a good home. You know, it was a loud, rambunctious home. It was a good home. Uh, but growing up, being masculine was very important. Uh, mm. Having a lot of older brothers and father being a hardworking man. 
uh, I had to pull my weight. I had to be a man, you know? So my dad instilled a lot of good uh, morals and ethics in me that I think are lost today. Um, and I appreciate him for that more now than I did then, but uh, it definitely helped mold me to the, to the person, the person I am. Um, we're going to, we're going to come back to that idea, but what, what then brought you into that first martial arts club? Uh, so like I said, uh, just rough housing with my brother. Um, I like that, you know, it, it felt, uh, it was fun. Uh, it felt like good. It was a good release for me. Uh, but then when he moved away, I didn't have that anymore. Uh, and then I used to get in trouble because I would try to emulate that with the neighborhood kids, but then mm. I, would... <laughs> <laughs> I would hurt the neighborhood kids because I was <clears throat> rough, like my brother played rough with me. So, but they didn't like that. So there was like, I didn't understand what was wrong. So I needed to have that, but I couldn't find it anywhere. Uh, and then uh, we moved to Brampton when I was nine years old, which was a shock because uh, I'd be on the street in Toronto and be kids every, playing everywhere. Uh, ice cream chuck, playing at the park. You know, you go to one person's house, you go to another person's house and you move to Brampton, it's crickets mm. uh, at that time. So, you know, it was really, it was really hard adjustment. Uh, and then, like I said, you know, I remember going to my sister's house uh, for my niece's birthday and we slept over. She lived at Victoria Park and we moved, we went from Brampton. We went there and we slept there and she went to Jumbo Video the night before and rented a few movies. So during the day while my sisters were getting the, you know, the place ready for the party, my sister's like, here, watch this. And she popped in Bloodsport. And that was it. I wanted to train martial arts. <laughs> so then I was like, okay, where do I learn martial arts? Uh, and then, you know, I dreamt of having my own Mr. Miyagi, but uh, my parents couldn't afford it. Uh, so there was a school, I'd say like 15 minutes away from my home at the Brampton Mall in Brampton. And I just, you know, you go out as a kid and you ride your bike and you meet up with your buddies. And I just discovered this dojo uh, in this mall. So I'd ride my bike there and kind of like creep them from the window and like watch what they're doing and then like go try it at home. Uh, ah. And then, and then, uh, <laughs> and then, um, you know, I think one of the sensei started catching on to me watching. Right. So he would like, he noticed me because that, like, this was like a weekly thing. You know, I'm this weird kid hiding behind a pole, like looking in their dojo. Uh, but the thing was, is I didn't have the courage to stick around because he did try to come to the door. Uh, you know, but at that time, oh, stupid kid, you know, like, oh, he's going to give me the death touch for learning his secrets. So I'd book it. Every time. <laughs> I, I would book it every time he came to the door. Right. So, <laughs> so you know, I, I always watched from afar and uh, I started like uh, getting into like black belt magazines and stuff like that. Uh, so I didn't start learning martial arts till I was 22 years old. So I started martial arts in 2002. Uh, so uh, I ended up, like I said, I hung around with bad people. Uh, just misguided people and then uh, I ended up getting arrested and charged uh, so when that happened um, it caused a problem with my family and myself I didn't realize you know I had to I had to change uh, who 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 I was hanging out with and what I was into so doing that I started making some changes in my life because I didn't want to be like I gotta understand something out of 10 kids I was the only one my father had to go pick up from jail mm. you know? so uh, my mom getting the phone call and you know passing out in the living room because police wanted to talk to her so that's not who I wanted to be and I was too thankful for my parents uh to be that for them so I understood I needed to change so I ended up um slowly started to change my attitude and you know disassociate myself with people and then I decided that I was gonna uh say you know what let me just get rid of my safety net uh, I'm gonna move to Toronto and work construction with my brother and I'm gonna rent out his um, bachelor apartment so sink or swim, didn't know how to cook. You know, I was a clean person, but I didn't know how to cook. Uh, I had to take care of myself. And down the street, there was a, uh, a Goju Ryu karate place. So I said, well, my parents can afford it, but I'm working. I live on my own. I got no friends down here purposely. I didn't give my number. So mm -hmm. that was the time. And um, that was it. I was hooked. Um, we're going to come back to what that karate club is and so on. But first off, you, you know, you're uh, just a touch younger than me. We're, we're four years apart, five years apart. And literally Karate Kid and Bloodsport are the reasons I'm in karate today. All those other movies and things came around to me later. But in the 80s, watching those, I'm like, I need to be able to do that. And um, I, I love hearing you say that. I want to back up real quick because uh, I want to keep going with your story. But you said something that I think is really important. And we might go around the horn on it. But 
you said something about the idea that your dad instilled in you some morals and ethics that you think have been lost and you didn't appreciate them at the time, but you do now. What are those and why do you think they get lost? Man. My dad, <clears throat> my dad left uh, a country that was under a dictatorship. Uh, Portugal at that time ha was being run by Salazar. Uh, so, you know, my dad had to stand in the corner of the street and a truck would drive up and they look at whoever looks strong and say, okay, get in the truck. You're working today. And if you didn't work hard, you didn't get in the truck the next day. So that means you have to go fish and, and feed your family. Uh, my brother would jump down in the water. You know, people would wash their clothes and their soap would break off. My brother would run down the stream, jump in the lake, grab the soap just so he could make a ball. So my mom could wash um, clothes for, for her kids. So my dad taught me to appreciate everything I had. And to and he taught me that. He's like, you know, if you ever come into hard times, you know, and you can't get a loan from the bank, you can get a loan on the street as long as your word is worth your merit. So be a man of your word. Uh, so that was another thing he taught me. He taught me to take pride in, in anything I did because what I did spoke about who I was. Uh, he told me that if you're going to fight for something, make sure you believe in it. Because if you don't, you won't win. And one of the things I learned from my dad was <clears throat> you'll never know a woman until you sleep with her. And you never know a man until you fight them. Because those are the two most rare and instinctive animalistic things that we are as human beings. And in, their, in those actions, there is no lying about who that person is. So he taught me uh, some some gems. Those are some fucking gems. And why do you think those have gotten lost? What do you, what do you think like what do you think diminishes those in our in our whatever our time? Comfort. Mm. Comfort. People will show their ass to get a like and then wonder why they can't have a serious relationship. People will edit something to make their skill look like at a level it's not but they won't put in the work to have it really work. I think people just don't, they just want the quick gratification. They want the, you want, they want the easy way, right? There's something about earning something that makes it worthwhile. Whereas it's just fabricated. It's good for a little bit, but it dissipates quick. Mm. We've talked about that on the show that the thing that makes training the hardest is how comfy our beds can be. And how how beautiful our family can be when they're looking at us, wondering why we're leaving again. Um, let's come back to the, pre uh, the, the present in your storyline. So there's a Gojiru club down the road. What's the club? What's the vibe like? And what keeps you there? Uh, <laughs> I didn't stay. So it was called AMA. <laughs> it was called AMA, Academy of Martial Arts. Um, it was a good school. It was a Gojiru karate and they also had Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. They merged Gracie Jiu-Jitsu education along with the program. So um, I was just happy. I was just happy to be in a club. Mm -hmm. uh, there was a cute girl that worked there. And um, she put her shin across my forehead in the first couple of weeks. So it was pretty humbling because I was like flirting on her. And she quickly showed me that <laughs> she wasn't having it. So it was humbling. It was great. Like, I loved it, right? Like, I just want to resemble the ethics and like I said, the morals that my dad gave, I wanted to feel like I was doing something good, something like this is a positive way to be violent. And I had that energy in me and I had, I had some anger in me still. And I, it was, it was just, it was great. I needed something. I wanted to be part of something and to be part of something that was, had prestige to it that had, um, I mean, think about it. We, we, we all are taking part of something that has been around for hundreds of years and will be practiced hundreds of years after we're dead. You know, and to be part of that, that's, that's, that, that gave me like a thrill, man. Like every society they have, you know, society has like your basic kind of like archetypes, you know, you have your merchants, your educators, your politicians, and you have your warriors and your agriculturalists. And I felt like I felt, I fell into that warrior thing, but at the time it's like, but how do I be this and not be what I was falling into, you know? So it was just, it was really good to do that. But um, that being said, when I started doing the jujitsu, I was like, oh, I don't want to do the karate. I want to do the jujitsu. And then I have a problem with people telling me what I can and cannot do. So when they said that, no, I have to do both programs, I said, see you later. So I left uh, because like 
the karate, even though I respect it, the Gujarat, I liked it. It was not for me. I was more, I felt more on the line. I felt like I was getting more out of the jujitsu side of it, but they wouldn't allow me to just do one or the other. And I was like, no, no, no. These people don't care about me and my growth and what I like. They care about selling programs. So I do. So I left. And then uh, I, I was, I started dating my wife in like 2004 and on my way to visit her, it's called Temple Kung Fu. Uh, it was on St. Clair and Oakwood area. Mm. It used to be above, I can't remember, not far from the Max Milk on the corner. So I was like, oh, Kung Fu, you know, uh, let me check this out. So I went in there and it was like more of a hybrid. It was like a Kung Fu karate. It was by Grandmaster. Uh, the art was originated by Grandmaster Oe Simon. He was a Polish gentleman. Uh, so he was, you know, he was around for a bit. So I, I, I went in there and checked it out and I liked it. Uh, I liked it. I liked that there was like um, a lot of aspects to it. It didn't have the ground stuff, but, you know, I was digging it and I, and I was there for a long time. Um, and then I started doing, um, I started hearing about like throwdowns and stuff like that in the city, mm. so going to throwdowns and fighting there. And I got my ass kicked. So whatever I got my ass kicked against, that's what I was now learning. So, um, I was like, okay, I was able to implement some stuff from my style, but there was definitely things I was not aware of. And that began my, you know, dive into what is out there. You know, what do I identify as? What is my body frame, my type of style? What am I drawn to? So I, I needed to research. So I started to seek. And um, while I did all this searching, I came across uh, C. Joe Bruce Lee's philosophies. And that connected right away because the thing mostly that drew me was um, it wasn't about the art. It was about the artist. And so that's where I started to seek you can go. Um, I just want to say that I think it's like, I, I love the humility of losing and going, I need to go learn the thing I don't know instead of pretend that, oh, well, that tournament doesn't count or, oh, that rule set's different. Like I've seen people lose and go, oh, it didn't count because, uh, you know, I didn't get knocked out or whatever. And it's like, well, within the rule set you did and, and that's life. And um I, I like the idea that you went, okay, I need to go find something that lets me do this. Let's back up for two secs though. Um, for people who don't know, what's a throwdown? What's it look like? What's it feel like? Okay, so a throwdown nowadays is different than a throwdown probably back then. So basically it's like a gym will host. Uh, there's a good place now in the city, uh, FAC, Fighting Arts Collective. Uh, that's owned by Sean Zerger, fantastic martial artist, good person. Um, he does a great job of doing it, but I've been to some other throwdowns that weren't quite so mm -hmm. uh, educational. Let's say it's, it's a good place because you can go there at a lot of different skill levels and just have fun and learn and be exposed to different things. Whereas before it was more of like uh, proving my art was better. Like I, I've seen some people like the sound of someone's leg breaking. I'll never forget that. At my first throwdown, it was like, I was shocked. I was like, where at, what the hell am I doing here? This is not what I signed up for, but um, man, it's like people from all over, they get together and it's like, Hey, uh, sensei Benson, you want to do a fight? Sure. All right. Uh, hard, soft, medium. Uh, let's go hard. Okay. What do you want to do? Striking only grappling MMA. Uh, let's do MMA. All right, let's do it. And that's how you meet people. I know. And that's another thing too. It's like, that's hard to find nowadays. Like people, People don't want to do that. I don't think not too many people. Anyway, there's always going to be the people that do it, but like a lot of people don't do it uh, because of their reputation or what, you know, but like, then it was more like these people were more thinking like, what can I do against a different style? It wasn't even about, you know, me. It was more like, how good is my shit? I need mm. to and I learned a lot, man. Like, getting taken down by somebody who's good at grappling and i had no idea what the hell to do on the ground it was like what the hell i know nothing you know and i'm doing like these snappy kung fu kicks and then i get a tie kick in the face um i used to compete in um uh, i placed in the kick nationals uh when i used to do that kind of the point sparring and the continuous sparring but before i did the continuous sparring I, did, I just mainly did the point sparring the point sparring is fantastic for certain things but the habit i built 
was not so good because I, <laughs> I, I, I would like, I would hit the guy quick and then stop. And then it was like, pop, 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 pop. so I was like, Oh shit, this isn't point sparring, you know? So it was just like the, it was a learning curve. It was, it was great though. You know, you learned, you got your lumps, but you learned and, and it was, it was a great experience. Um, I love that you're saying you got your lumps, but you learned. I think a lot of people don't want to take the lumps. Um, and the other thing I want to ask you, you, and, and, and again, I hope you take this obviously the right way. We love Bruce Lee around here, like his, his names and quotes uh, for all of us, but he's not known to have been much of a street fighter, much of a competitor. And so what would make you as a guy who's going into throwdowns go, that's the system I want to follow. One that's arguably not super ring tested. So at that time, like I said, I hadn't really started my formal training in Jeet Kune Do. This was me in the search of it. Right. And so, so when I was going to these throwdowns, I was being exposed to all these different arts. And the one thing that I learned was, is like, there is no one art. That was the one thing I did know. There was no one art. All right. So if there's no one art, then what is the overwhelming factor that's going to guarantee my success? And I started to realize, well, that's my performance. How I adapt to the puzzle in front of me. Okay, well, what if he's a grappler? Well, then I need to have some grappling. Okay, what kind of grappling? I don't know. What is there? You know, one thing I started to learn, uh, and it was made very evident to me. Well, I was, you know, when you learn something, but then somebody like articulates it to you and it's like, oh, yeah, that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Where it was in every fight right and this is why i uh sensei suino anybody who does the judo or any clinch fighting will understand is any fight you have the clinch is the nucleus so if you start striking sooner or later the gap gets closed in self-defense sooner or later even if you don't know how to fight or know how to fight if you know how to fight you grab somebody you dirty box them you hit them you work your close if you don't know how to fight you're reaching for what's hitting you so you can control it right somebody who wants to throw you wants to get in close and put their hands on you a wrestler is going to want to double leg you you know so the, the range always has to get closed and now if you can close the range now you have a choice well now i can take you down or i have to be have good takedown defense or as in Muay Thai, I cause damage in the clinch. So the clinch is the nucleus. Whoever can control the clinch will control the fight because that's the deciding factor. Does it stay standing? Does it go to the ground? Or do I punish you here? So I started to like make, do my math. And then I started to like, like I said, then I, as I was doing these, living these experiences and picking up these little things, I was also reading books. And when I started to read about Bruce Lee's philosophy, I was like, Man, that's this is what I'm seeing. Right? I'm gonna punch, I'm gonna punch the kicker. I'm gonna kick the puncher. I'm gonna strike the grappler. I'm gonna grapple the strike wherever they suck. So what does that mean? I have to be well-rounded. Trade is the master of none, but a master of but there's a there's a phrase that's longer to it that pretty much says, in essence, is the jack of all trades will have a better success because they have more tools right? So you can specialize in one thing, but if I can expose what that one thing is that you're weak at, and I actually am okay at it, I don't have to be great at it. I'm okay at it. All I got to do is make you fight there, you know? So <clears throat> I was just looking for that Swiss army knife. And mm. uh, so I just kept training and just kept picking up this and that. And then, you know, if I get thrown by a judo guy, I'm like, oh shit, you know, this is how the, why did that happen? I got to watch his hips. All right. I got to watch his hips. I got to watch my hips. I got to watch his sweeps. If I was fighting a Thai guy, I have to watch his hand placement because I'll get elbowed or I, he's going to control my head so that I, my spine's not straight and I don't have no posture. If I was going to grab, you know, spar a, a Thai fighter, I got to make sure my stance isn't too wide and try to box him because I'm too heavy on my legs. I won't be able to shield it. And if I'm sparring a boxer, I got to watch the power in his legs. So I got to keep range while I use my legs. So, you know, this was where I started really identifying as a Jeet Kune Do, uh, philosophy and practitioner and then i sought a jeet kundo instructor which took me a while but i found him in 2007 so you kind of got your um your blood sport in <laughs> by going to these throwdowns uh, i actually want to go um to our 10 questions now which is what we ask all our guests um and we ask that you answer as impulsively as you can 
but that then you expand on your answer as you wish. Ready for your 10 questions? Good. Great. What is the most effective move in your martial arts arsenal? Hmm. Avoidance. The art of fighting without fighting. But if you're talking physically, uh, I love a good old headbutt or finger job to the eyes. Um, who is the most influential martial artist in your life? I'd say Bruce. Bruce Lee. Um, this next one might be easy then. Who do you think is the most influential martial artist of all time and why? Mm, that's a really good question. Well, I don't, I can't say one person. Uh, I'd have to say three. Um, I'd have to say Bruce Lee and Muhammad Ali because they didn't just exercise their craft and do things that were different. Uh, like Bruce Lee was well ahead of his time with regards to sports science. Uh, his concept of, like I said, the art over the artist, uh, the artist over the art, uh, his research into different systems and taking what was effective, useful and using it. Muhammad Ali, nobody ever seen a rope of dope, his confidence, his, um, the way he carried himself. But most of all, it was what they did, uh, what they did for the people who were watching them. Like Bruce Lee fought racism. Like he really, he gave the Asian people community a hero. Uh, he crossed a lot of boundaries. Uh, he changed a lot of perceptions. He, he, you know, he roughed with feathers, but he, he he broke a lot of barriers. And I think that's important because he had the moxie and the courage to do it. Muhammad Ali wouldn't go to war. Mm. And lost his life. Like, these are the things. Like, martial arts, it's not just the physical. It's mind, body, spirit. And these guys, these guys lived it, you know. They took their punishment, but they stood by their word. And I identify that because of my father's, uh, like I said, what my father instilled in me. And I've seen these guys be strong and, and stick to their convictions. So I'd have to say those two. And I'd have to say Mike Tyson as well. Mike Tyson came from the dirt and, you know, he smashed people. He was a, he was a, he was a murderer. He wasn't there to make money. He was there to hurt people. But now look at him now. Look at the knowledge he drops now. Look what he's turned his life into now. If that isn't a sign of resilience and adaptation, like, I don't know what is. And that's what martial arts, I think, should be. <laughs> Thank you for that. We love that answer. Um, what excites you most about the next five years of your training? Uh, so I definitely, um, like right now, I've been focusing a lot uh, on, on my Muay Thai. Uh, I, I'm, I'm messing around a lot with uh, stick grappling, submissions with the stick. So jujitsu with the stick on the ground. And with that kind of merging, I'm using that to uh, share that with like law enforcement to uh, make use with their baton if they get taken down to the ground. Um, so I'm playing around with that. Um, but I plan to refocus my energy again into grappling. Um, I'm like my jujitsu specifically under Renshi. Uh, I've been prolonging that and kind of taking time away from that. And I stopped forcing myself to like, oh, you got to go back. No, I'm like, it's a season right now. This is happening. And it's going to come because it's starting to come into my life again for a reason, like for work, I'm going to be needing to sharpen up my grappling. Uh, so I'll be coming back into that, but um, I want to focus on uh, in the next five years, definitely get my brown belt in, under Renshi and, um, and uh, possibly, you know, having some students win some titles in, uh, in Muay Thai or low kick or K1. Right on. If heaven exists, what would you like to hear God say when you get there? Well done, my good and faithful servant. Um, is there a martial artist, living or dead, in all of recorded history you'd want to train with the most? Mm. Mm. Yeah. Well, dead, I would say Bruce. Uh, alive, I'd love to train with uh, George St. Pierre. Because he is, uh, the reason why he's so effective is, like I said, he could control the clinch, he could take you down at will, and he could strike you if you're a good grappler. So he kind of embodied, I think that's why he did so well. He's a master Shuto fighter. And uh, that's definitely one person I'd love to spend time training with. If everyone in the world could have the greatest benefit martial arts has given you, whether they train or not, what benefit would they be getting? Hmm. That's a good question. Um, 
humbleness and compassion, right? You have to be compassionate uh, for people because, you know, if you have the ability to hurt somebody, it doesn't mean that you should. You know, you should always have compassion for them first, try to relate to somebody first and be humble because there's always a harder rock, you know? And our last two questions come as a pair. Uh, what's your greatest achievement and what's your greatest regret? The greatest achievement, I would say, was um, I had a student uh, named Vashon. When I met him, he was like his troublemaker, chubby kid. And within three years, he won... Uh, he won the middleweight. Uh, he won the middleweight cadet uh, WKF national uh, championship in K one, uh, and it was it was a it was a it was so it was so fulfilling to see somebody that I gave shit and pushed and yelled and barked at, and to see him actually like tear up when he won, and him winning that was just like man. It really is not about you. It, it, the shit you go through is for you. But the like, once you have that, once you get to a level where you're content with your ability, like, what do you do with it? You're just going to hold on to it? No, you got to make the next generation better. You got to pass it. And to be able to feel like I passed it and felt him feel empowered, that for me is, I think, why we all kind of do it. Uh, biggest regret, I didn't start when I was younger. Mm. Yeah, I would have loved to have competed more when I was younger. Yeah, if I started younger, I think I would have battled a lot. Of, I would have I would have conquered a lot of demons earlier on in life, and I would have been more free and liberated to do more uh, than what I did at the time when I started. Um, many of our guests don't have regrets, but a lot of the regrets that do show up are are, are around time, around wouldn't <laughs> mind a little extra back. On the front end, <laughs> on the front end, when the knees are still ten out of ten. Um, so I want to go back to something, and I want I want to go around the horn on this, and we'll start with you. Um, is you know this is this is not a concept we've heard a ton on the show of the martial artist over the martial art. So I want you to break that open for us, and then we'll go around the horn on our thoughts on that, whether we agree or disagree. What does that mean for you? For me. Yes, Sifu. So, so, like, how can I explain this? So, if I learn an art, I'm learning an expressed idea that's been cataloged, right? And it's passed down lineage to lineage. And usually what's passed down is what, what we know works, right? You don't keep, you don't teach what doesn't work, right? And so it's been, it's been kept and, and, you know, preserved for a reason. But that this knowledge that's being passed for somebody, it's like if it's being taught by somebody who who who's isolated in the mountains or whatever, they're not having much exposure. You know, they're gonna keep this art a certain way, or they're gonna keep to this, right? But I think in in martial arts in general, all martial arts have crossed paths and have influenced each other anyway, right? But the one keeping to the one art is like I'm learning something that's been passed on by somebody through their through their uh experience theirs and their experience is going to be biased based on their abilities and their thought process or training methodologies right now myself as a person like you have people who are, who are naturally inclined to want to grapple you have people who are naturally inclined to want to strike and on those two sides of the fence, there is a variety and a multitude of different flavors from boxers to kickboxers, from judo to jujitsu. There's so many ways to filter through the flavors, right? And so I don't want to just learn uh, one way because I don't believe there is one way. What I try to do is like... When, when I go through all these different martial arts, one thing that I have learned is I find what the common denominators are. Like the body only moves a certain amount of ways, yeah? But like each art, you're going to see familiar movements. So what they call it is going to be different or their way of executing it is going to be different. 
The reason why they execute it is going to be different, but it's there. And it's important to learn why, because if I'm looking at my hand here, you see this hand, but you don't see this side. And if I'm only looking at this side, I don't see this side. But if I have an understanding of both sides, I have a greater understanding of the hand as a, in, a, in general. So I think it's important to understand why people do things and how they developed that thing. Because how they develop that thing, I can even just extract that. I don't even have to take your technique. I just can take how you build the attribute for that thing. And then that way you develop that attribute can actually heighten the attributes I need to do my thing. It's just knowledge, right? So I don't have to look at it as taking your technique. I can take your training methodology. I can take your drill, I cultivate, you know, this particular fast twitch muscle. How do you guys? Oh, that's interesting. How can I apply that to my boxing? Oh, how does a boxer's footwork? How can I apply that to this? So it's just looking for the common denominators. And when I can start to look at things through principle and function, then it really doesn't matter what the style is. Because when you get into a fight, you're fighting. It doesn't look like one thing anyway. You might see something fly out. You know, if I go to the ground, you're going to know I have some ground game. But, it, you know, is it CSW? Is it Japanese jiu-jitsu? Is it Brazilian jiu-jitsu? What is it? I don't know. But it's jiu-jitsu. It's grappling. So I don't, I, I like to, I'd like to just learn um, the commonalities. And once you find the commonalities, I like to focus on that because there's a reason why they all share it because it's truth. I really like that answer. And it reminds me of my old math days when I got good at math because our teacher taught us first principles, not formulas. Um, let me jump to you, Sensei Suino. Um, where do you want to chip in on this conversation about the martial artist versus the martial art? Well, that's an important, it's an important idea because we like to say, oh, you know, the early days of the UFC, well, let's put sumo against wrestling or let's put uh, uh, karate against BJJ. And then uh, on the basis of that one trial, you can't say that that art is better than that art because the, there's two fighters and one fighter might be a better representative of his, of his art or he might just have had a better day. Um, but what you can say is the UFC, among others, is a great proving ground. And if you see a martial art uh, be a part of somebody's game and they prevail over and over again, or people with that game prevail over and over again, you can start to see that there's some things important there. Um, the individual is always important. You know, uh, Sifu mentioned GSP, right? Like immensely talented, immensely intelligent, immensely hardworking guy, right? The person is very important. And even with even somebody else with that skill set might not have prevailed the way he did. But it's also true that statistically, more UFC champions have had some wrestling than any other single martial art. Is that because they've learned double legs? Or is it because wrestlers train as hard as you can imagine, especially when they're kids, right? And they've learned to just grind it out. Um, it's a fascinating conversation to me. Um, and and uh, uh, I don't think there's a simple answer. But I think it's absolutely true that the that the fighter makes as much difference as the martial art does. Thanks, Sensei. Hanchi Legacy, let's go to you next. Where do you want to chip in on the idea of the martial artist versus the martial art? Well, I would have to say, if you can't beat a grappler with your art, go practice your art more. Don't change your art. And the other thing is that if you find that you belong to a classical art, that it's not one person. It's everybody from Matsumura to me that you will learn from. And I'm sure that in those days where they fought each other and killed each other, that they have allowed in their art for grappling, uh, groundwork, and striking. Um, hence the historical story or fact that um, um, Hitoshi Yasutsune at 75 years old faced a, ja faced a Japanese judo guy and dropped him in one shot because he was a well-versed fighter. And uh, I'm not saying that that's the way it is for everyone, but I'm saying that you need to hone your art. If you're a half-ass fighter, a half-ass grappler, you're gonna get dropped by somebody who's good at their art. That is only my opinion. Thanks, Hanchi. Um, Sensei Dolphin, where do you go with this or anything in this topic area? I just find 
the discussion to be bouncing around a little bit, Sean. Uh, in my opinion, it's bouncing around because we've talked about UFC. That's not combat, that's sport. Like we're not talking about self-defense there. We're talking about sport, okay? We start talking about history. Well, there was no internet back then, right? Like if I stood in front of Matsumura and said, BJJ, blah, blah, blah. Matsumura is a soldier. He was training for a primary purpose, which was to kill another person who tried to attack the king. That was his job. That was what he was going to do. He was going to pull a sword out and cut your head off primarily. And then if his sword broke, then he is going to use his striking skills. And so I just kind of want to uh, bring this back a little bit. Um, you know, I train these days. In the past, I trained before to compete and fight against other martial artists, you know, karate people. I am legacy shorter karate jitsu until I die. I love that martial art. That's the number one martial art for me. It's going to be the number one martial art. It was the number one martial art when I started and it will be. And if I didn't think it was, I should go do something else, right? <laughs> Why would you choose the third best martial art to apply your whole life to? That would be stupid. You would be foolish to do that. Um, but I train my art to come up against somebody who hasn't trained before, right? And so a judo person you're we talked about this before since legacy already said like you know you train hard i don't give a shit like i'll stand next to sense of Sfino on the street and take a step back and watch him slam the earth into somebody that doesn't know how to do martial arts and you know point at them and go ha ha right mm -hmm. and i'm sure he'll step back every once in a while and watch me turn somebody's head into a pez dispenser like so I don't know. I don't like the conversation about which art is better. I do like um, what Sensei Medeiros is talking about when it comes to him and what he wants to achieve with himself and building himself into a martial artist that can stand, can grapple, can clinch. I think all of those things are important. I think they're all important for self-defense or martial arts uh, competing against another martial artist. But I just think the conversation bounced around a little bit. I think uh, if you're a good martial artist and you apply yourself to your art, you're going to do fine when push comes to shove. Um, as long as, and I'll punctuate this with something that Sans Suino says all the time, you find, and actually Sifu Madero's talked about this as well, you find the best teacher, right? It doesn't matter if, if you think Shoranru is the best, but the Shoranru teacher is a fucking shitty person and they're a shitty teacher, you're not going to get good at it. Then you need to go find, and the best person in your town is a judo teacher and they're dynamic and charismatic and they can teach you all these elements, then go do judo. So I guess what I'm saying is I'm lucky that I found Sensei Legacy, great Shoranru teacher. That's why I'm doing what I'm doing and that's why I think it's the best. And I hope my students feel the same way or they go somewhere else and do the thing that they think is the best. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Sensei. Um, Sensei Medeiros, you said, you said something earlier that I want to go back to, which is the idea of, you know, you, you, you wanted to be the warrior. You hit that club uh, early on and you're like, wow, I found a way that I could be this warrior that doesn't necessarily have those negative aspects to it that you grew up with. How? I mean, we're talking about training, but Warrior is a really specific term, and, and I really like the way you talked about the different functions within society, you know, the agriculturalist or the, the politician or whatever. And so how does one be a warrior? I think it's just, um, you know, we have a sense of a duty. Uh, we have a sense of wanting to protect, wanting to stand up for the people who we see maybe can't stand up for themselves. You have an urge for that. I've always had an urge for that. Um, and so, you know, that's not an easy thing to do, especially now. Uh, I think people, when they, you know, they don't want to go with the, with what's expected or what's, you know, mandated or anything, you know, that's against the grain. It's hard for people to stand up and for their convictions and stand alone and be willing to take the shit that comes with it if they believe it's right. Uh, especially if they believe that they're protecting their loved ones and their best interests. So how do you do that? You have to be strong, right? You have to be strong mentally. You have to be strong, you know, spiritually. You have to be strong physically. 
and um you know so to be able to be strong mentally you know i had to i had to grow up i had to take myself out of my comfort zone hence that's why i took myself away and made myself learn to live on my own to be responsible to be accountable uh spiritually you know i have my faith and uh physically i i needed to give myself the tools i need because i feel like as a father as a son as a brother as a friend i want to be able to protect my loved ones if i need to and you know that was always my main focus in training martial arts i didn't really give a shit about competing too much at first and then i did a little bit and i was like yeah it's fun but it's that's not my my main reason for doing this i just want to make sure that i can you know heaven forbid something happens all right we're all men here i'm assuming we all have family and kids imagine something happened and you had you were powerless to stop it or at least give it a good go and try to protect how could you look yourself in the mirror and say man you've been wasting all this time doing stupid shit you couldn't have invested in your own self to protect your loved ones or yourself i can't live with that so for me that was something very important that i had to do because i know one day <clears throat> I, I wanted to be a father i wanted to be a husband and i wanted to make sure that i my job is to provide him to protect thanks so much we'll do we'll do a quick round on the horn on this hanchi legacy you know what does it mean to be a warrior how does someone be a warrior today uh, i don't know <laughs> I don't know. I just, I don't know. Sorry. That's okay, Anshi. Thanks. Sensei Suino? Well, when you're a warrior in times there's no war, then you train, right? And that means you're ready for war, but more importantly, you're changing yourself. You're changing your character. You're becoming deeper and uh, influencing people around you. I like the Tibetan Buddhist idea of a warrior is the person who stays on the horse. What they mean by that, right, is that you take the middle road, you pay attention, and you don't let yourself fall off either side. All right, our path is martial arts. If the if the path of martial arts is a horse, we stay on the horse, we stay on the saddle, we don't fall off either. So uh, either side, if war does arise, we're prepared for it, right? Mentally, physically, spiritually. If it doesn't, we're prepared for life mentally, mm. spiritually, physically. I think that's what it means. Mm. Thank you, Sensei. Sensei Dofa? Warriors fight when others can't or won't. Yep. Yep. Appreciate that, everybody. Um, Sen Sifu Madeiros, we have a question that came in from ZT, one of our uh, our fans who asks a lot of questions and, and, and a martial artist and Sensei's club. Um, when you learn all these different martial arts, does your understanding of all of them change from when you learn them versus when you teach them to your students? And if you could talk a bit about that change that I'm assuming happens. Uh, so just to just to kind of reiterate, when I learn an art, I'm not talking about like three, four months. Like I've spent, like I've started training in 2002. I still practice my Mo, Mo Pai Kempo I started in 2004 till this day. When I started training Jeet Kune Do, I started training 2007. Everything is geared towards that philosophy. And there is curriculum. There is, you know, standards. You know, it's hard to teach that art and standard, but there are certain criteria and certain techniques. And I train them often. When I train Jiu-Jitsu, I train it. I train Jiu-Jitsu in the context and in the matrix in which it's given to me because I'm there to learn a specific skill set. When I self-train, all I'm doing is learning how to merge and bridge the gap. So if I'm striking you, I'm if I'm if I'm gonna use like Muay Thai round kicks, but that doesn't mean I neglect my front snap kick and my low line side kick. I don't think what art am I fighting? I'm just using techniques that are available to me based on range. I'm range fighting. If I'm on the outside, I fight with the outside. If I'm with the weapon, I fight with the weapon. If I'm grappling with the weapon, I'm going to use jujitsu, but now I'm going to incorporate the stick. If I'm in close range, I'm going to clinch you. I'm going to elbow you. I'm also going to trap you. I'm going to finger jab you, headbutt. I'm just exploring all the information I've learned, and I put them into categories of range. All right? So when I teach somebody, somebody comes to me and they want to learn Muay Thai, I'm teaching them Muay Thai. However, I might teach them Muay Thai with some JKD principles like indirect attack, 
attack by combination, single direct attack. These are the five ways attack in JKD. But these things are not just held to JKD. All arts use them. So how can I express these things within the context of this art? I can express that intercepting somebody with a front teep in Muay Thai. I can express that with a finger jab to the eye in JKD. I can express that with a jab in boxing. All I need to do is just learn how to merge the gap. So when I teach a specific art, if somebody comes to me for a specific art, I will give them that specific art. When somebody asks me to teach them self-defense, I'm giving them an amalgamation of my, my training. That's how I, uh, that's how I do it. And so you, you, you're, you're adapting them as they, you're, you're, you're learning them as they are, and then you're passing them on as they are, but with the understanding of certain principles that you've gained along the way. Um, like, for example, like if, if I stay on the inside, I want to intercept somebody. If somebody throws a jab, right? If I'm thinking about self-defense, I'll parry that jab, but I'll split it. So if they throw their jab, I'll parry their, with my rear hand, the outside of their jab, and I'll shoot that finger jab into their eye, right? So as they punch, they do this. So boom. And then I can follow the boxing. If they hold on to me and I grab them, I'm switching to a different language. Right away, I'm going to use my Muay Thai training. I'm going to headbutt. I'm going to elbow. I'm going to do whatever. If they clinch up and body lock, now I have to switch to wrestling. If it goes to the ground, I have to use my jiu-jitsu training, right? So I'm going to fight according to wherever the fight goes, wherever the best results I have within my arsenal, I'm going to use that in context. That's the way I look at it because that way it's easy for me to understand. I'm just, I'm just going where the language goes. Right on. Um, we had another question come in. Um, I know we had a bunch of sensei do but this one came in to me earlier from Renchi Taylor. Uh, he, he said, ask about the first couple months training with him. Oh, I got choked by the same shit for three months. <laughs> I, would, I, would drive to, I would drive to class already mad, saying there's no way I'm going to let this guy fucking get me again with this shit. And then I would be even more mad driving all the way home saying, I can't believe he got me with that shit. And that was the story for three months. It was but it was fun and it was humbling. And the moment that I started to defend it and, and, you know, it was great. It was like, oh, yes. And then that's when the fun and learning started. But yeah, it was, it was not fun for the first few months. Um, talk to us for the last little bit of time we have about your work with law enforcement, about how um, that came to pass, about how that changed your concept of martial arts. So uh, that greatly impacted um, my training in self-defense and how I teach it. Um, I have a I have a friend uh, and a training um, training friend uh, named Paul Rubio who introduced me to um, this guy named Taylor McPhee who owns McFerrer who owns uh, Chimera Firearms Training, and he provides uh, use of force training and law enforcement uh, for law enforcement and armed guards. Uh, they do a lot of scenario uh, training, uh, so like you know, uh, emptying out a bank machine. Uh, showing up to a call with an irate person, um, gun grab, knife attack, all that stuff, right? So uh, through Paulo, Paulo has a, a large channel and um, a lot of, uh, he knows a lot of people in the community from his channel. He's well known that way. And so he exposed me to this guy and uh, they asked me if I wanted to do some scenario acting and, uh, you know, add on with some of my training, uh, you know, kind of like give some feedback and stuff. So I started working with them, uh, with this guy, and um, I started to do it more regularly. And I would basically dress up, suit up, and I would attack them. I would, you know, give them different energies. And um, through that, uh, I also started to learn what their uh, protocols are, how do they deal with people, how what they look for, how they language, how they uh, assess the situation, how they, you know, how they assess a threat, how they use verbal commands, how they work together as a partner when cuffing. And um, through doing that kind of stuff, it kind of educated me a little bit more on the cues that they work for. Okay. And so, yeah, so I use that uh, within my own training, but I started doing a lot of that and, um, and you know, working more towards that field right now. And um, I want to ask this question. I, I try to ask it of anybody who's dealing with the law enforcement side, because I think it's, it's a really interesting thing for, for somebody who's on what we'll call the front line on that really regular basis. And for somebody who's maybe listening and, and trying to think, Again, almost like the first question, like how to apply those martial arts in a real way when you're not necessarily used to that. My question is really non-physically, what would you tell people is the most important thing to be training in your martial arts to be ready for that intensity of a situation? A lot of it has to be with um, 
paying attention, like really paying attention, paying attention to people's voice, paying attention to people's posture, the distance, uh, de-escalation tactics is huge. You gotta understand when somebody's drunk and irate, they're not listening to you. You want to make them feel like they're being listened to. You don't want to do it. If their voice is here, don't match their voice because then you're going to make it an argument. Stay level, make them calm down. You know, if somebody could be uh, mentally, you know, uh, challenged, they could have a problem. They could have schizophrenia. They have something like that. And you can't just base your course of action on your just your first gaze of the situation. You have to really pay attention. And uh, that's a, that's a tough skill. Like, I attack these guys uh, with like fake training knives and stuff like that. And I'm not attacking full speed. I mean, we start slow and we, we amp it up, but these guys got a lot of decisions to make before they act. And, you know, they got to make the right choice in a short amount of time. And it's not an easy thing, um, but definitely a lot can be uh, deterred. If you have good communication with your partner, understanding where to stand, lines, lines of fire, you know, Understand controlling a room, controlling a situation, how to articulate your command, uh, understanding the range of distance, when to amp it up, when to turn it down. It's like these guys, you know, if they're asking you to do something and you're listening to them, you know, they, they it's like they reinforce that. They make you want to listen, right? But if you don't listen to what they're saying and you put them in a threat, they have to take control of that situ situation right away because the room for error is very small. I really appreciate that. That was really, really concise. Um, so Sifu, what we like to do is we go around the horn at the end of our, our chat. So we're going to start with Hanshi and go through the teachers. And then that way, the last word will go to you. But before we do that, ladies and gentlemen, I want to thank everybody who runs punch, kick, choke chat, Robert Shlumsky, Justin Shea, Andre Sedeshev, Alden Adair, Jesse Levitao, Sydney Dauphin, Josh Kitchens, Christiana Landl, Daniel J. Holland, Dre Guliani, and Stavros Cerulius. They're running things behind the scenes in a way that you don't see. You get to see us and we stand on the platform that they help build. So I just want to say thanks to them every week because it's really important that the, their names get heard. And um, let's start with you, Hunch Legacy. What do you want to say about our chat tonight? That was a good chat. I, I was sort of interested about his, uh, about Mark's uh, beginnings that were similar to mine. And, you know, hunting around and being in a rough neighborhood, et cetera. So probably a lot of things that happened to you happened to myself. And thanks for your views today. I appreciate you coming on our show. Thank you so much. Thanks, Hanchi Lexi. Um, Sensei Suino? Yeah, I, I love this chat. Um, just a few highlights, and I know Randy usually goes through a, a bunch of them. Um, I think one of my favorite things, Sifu, was just listening to you talk and seeing your face light up when you're talking about being a kid on a bike, rolling up to that window of the dojo. Uh, you know, I remember, I remember, you know, as a kid going to the Ann Arbor Y and watching judo class from the sidelines. Same kind of thing, right? Just, oh my gosh, this is amazing. Um, and then from you, you know, in the same conversation for from you to go to that, to talking about the old school values that you got from your, your father and how you're kind of living into them now in the martial arts. That's a really cool, that's a really cool arc. I'd love to see where it goes in 10 years, 20 years, 30 years. Um, and then two other things you said that just kind of left an impression on me. One was uh, uh, the idea of a throwdown and being able to go in and pick from the buffet. Let's fight. Let's fight. <laughs> I want to fight light. But I want to have no heel hooks or, you know, whatever that might be. That's I, that's my kind of buffet. I got to tell you. Um, <laughs> and and then the last thing, which I already mentioned, was the idea of drawing a distinction between bar fights, self-defense and then refereed fighting. That's cool. I like that uh, that way of thinking about it. Thanks for coming on. Uh, uh, it's been a great show and um, I'm looking forward to talking to you again some more in the future. Thanks so much, Sensei Sweeto. Sensei Dauphin? Really love this chat. I love the practicality of the chat. It was no bullshit. I always write down a lot of stuff. I know uh, Sifu really, he believes what he's saying. And I think what he's saying is correct. Um, it started right at the beginning, right? When he started talking about no referees, what the terrain is like on the ground when you're fighting. Love that shit, right? Uh, a thought that he dropped in that, I never thought about before was a lot of good people teach martial arts, but good people don't really, they're not rounders. They haven't been out on the street and smacked around a little bit. Um, again, that's why I'm happy. I have the teacher that I have. Um, um, 
if somebody's too friendly and persistent, that should be a red flag for you. He said that. And I think anybody who's pestering you about anything like repeatedly, that should be a red flag for you. Why are they? It has to be something in it for them, not something in it for you. Right. So, That's so I really like that. Uh, stern dad. I had a really stern dad too. Uh, everything was black and white with him. You didn't never dare say to him, I don't know, or like <laughs> there is going to be a lot of shit going down. 10 siblings. My dad had eight. And my mom had seven. And we lived in the same kind of housing complex and they all had two or three kids. So I grew up in this complex with like 37 cousins. And yeah. <laughs> so kind of some shared stuff there. Blood sport, love, love blood, blood sport. That's brought you in. Uh, is same for me with my cousins watching uh, Sunday afternoon Kung Fu movies and trying to do that stuff, right? Like on each other. It was, uh, again, you couldn't afford it. My mom wouldn't pay for it. Um, my grandmother gave me my first hundred bucks so I could join karate because my mom refused because I was just too rough when I was in high school. And she thought you're just going to be more efficient at beating people up. Um be a man of your word, be proud of the things that you achieve. Your dad told you that. I think those are two good pieces of advice that he gave you. Um, you said this, which I think is really cool. You wanted to find a positive way to be violent. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like we've all found this positive way to be violent. I love that. Like, I just like that so much. Um, avoidance. That's a good one. Obviously, you said, I like that you said Bruce Lee, Muhammad Ali, and Mike Tyson. I liked all your reasons why. And I think it's really cool that as a classical martial artist, you chose two boxers. I think that's obviously like Muhammad Ali is my hero. His picture hangs in here. He's since legacy's hero. Great person. Um, train with GSP. If you hook that up, I will pay you so that we can all come and train with him too. We all want to train with GSP. <laughs> Love that motherfucker. We all want to train with him. Um, um, once you have ability, what do you do with it? You got to pass it on, right? You said that. And I think that's true. We're all living into that. Um, but you also said something about near the end where you said the techniques need to be put into categories of range. That just really resonated with me when you said that, that techniques need to be put into category of range. I really agree with that. I also agree with what I've had this reoccurring thought, Sifu, as I've been listening to you talk. I really hope I can talk to you again in 20 years because I'd really like to see, like your thinking right now is so deep. I would really, I know it's going to be exponentially different. Um, when you're into your fifties or, you know, sixties, I think you're going to have, you're going to have something the martial arts needs. You're going to have a certain maturity of thought and technique that people are going to really benefit from. And yeah, I, uh, I'm also very grateful that you would come on and share your thoughts so openly and so confidently. So thank you for doing that. Thank you so much. Thanks so much, Sensei Dofan. Um, because I get to guide the chat, I don't say a lot uh, right now, but I just want to say three things that stood out for me. I love that you said headbutt. I mean, the number of times I'm close to someone's nose and I just want to, I mean, especially when I'm grappling, I'm like, God, I'd love to just right now. And uh, I like that that's one of your most effective techniques. You know, Sensei Dofan just alluded to this. No one here is young, but you're not old. And that your greatest achievement is actually your student's achievement is something that I think says a lot about you. And I really appreciated hearing you and watch how excited you got talking about the work that you got to do with them and what they got to benefit from. And, um, you know, I, we talked about it, but but just the values from the father. You know, my dad gave me some stuff too. And uh, just some simple ideas that that work. And, and I hope everybody's getting those. And I like the idea that when you look at, you know, how, how people won't necessarily they'll, they'll want to take the photo on Instagram instead of actually do the work that you know maybe leads to the photo or not and and I like that I like that old school vibe so I just want to say thanks so much for that and uh, the last word um our new friend will go to you well uh, thank you very much everybody for the kind words uh it's extremely humbling and a great opportunity to sit here and speak with you guys you guys have a lot of experience um you know and I know 
I know you guys have a lot, you have the passion and you put in a lot of sweat and tears. So to hear that from, you know, my fellow martial artists with uh, that kind of dedication uh, is very, very appreciative and humbling. Um, I like the fact that we all didn't agree on every single aspect. Uh, that makes that makes me respect you guys even more so. Um, and then we're not just blowing smoke up each other's asses. So I, I thank you for your honesty. And uh, I just want to say a quick shout out. Thank you to um, Ranchy Scott Taylor for putting my name in the bucket and getting to meet these uh, wonderful people. And I would love, absolutely love to learn and train with you guys in the future and hopefully meet in person and uh, just can continue the, um, the friendship. And just to anybody who's watching, just keep, you know, just keep doing what you're doing and whatever you do, be intimate with it, really get to know it, love it and live it. That's it. Thank you so much for that. Thank you for watching, everybody. Join us next week for Perry, William, Kelly at the same time, same channel. And we're so excited to join us tonight. Thank you, Senseis, for letting me be a part of this. Good night, everyone. Thanks, Thanks everybody. everybody.